Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Jew and Gentile podcast. I am your host, Chris Katolka, and with me is none other than the sage himself, the Jewish sage, Steve Herzig. Steve, how are you? Chris, I'm doing okay. I'm an old man, and I hurt my back over the weekend. <laughs> I love that that's what you open with. Of course, I've got it. Well, we'll talk about Yiddish words, but uh, yeah, let's just say I'm about uh, 60%, but 60% of me is uh, worse than about everybody else. Okay, so you're feeling it right now. I'm feeling it. I'm really feeling it. All right, well, hopefully the Jew and Gentile podcast boosts your spirits. One thing I found, I was telling my wife after I got hurt, one thing I found that, uh, because I met with a pastor over uh, yesterday, and I was still hurting, but the whole conversation, we were engaged. I never felt anything. It was once when I was, so talking helps me. Yeah. So the Jew and the Gentile is rehab. It's, it is a remedy to the low, is it lower back? It's lower back. So you were doing, uh, I mean, of course you called you, on the podcast, you have called your pool. Uh, the the black, black hole. hole. That's the right. The black hole. And it's not because it looks like a black hole. It's because that's where you take all your money and just you just drop and it into dr- the... Drop it in. That's drop right. it in. And actually, I uh, posted on our refrigerator along next to all the grandkids' pictures and things like that. I got a score of 80% on my pool. <laughs> <laughs> so you felt I, like you're back in school. <laughs> I had 40%. I You have to take your water to a pool place and they drop it and they put stuff in it and they tell you hey you need this you need that my pool is an addict it's drug addict yeah it's a drug addict <laughs> and i gotta give it drugs and it just because it's good on one day doesn't mean it's good on the next so i went up in four days i went from 40 percent to 80 percent. i'm putting that on the fridge good for you you are excelling in life i am cavelling. i can tell you that. oh we'll talk about that well now you're cavelling that's yeah, right that's right we've used that one yeah already. we've used that yiddish word but it, can uh can i also say as you're cavelling, you hurt your back because of the pool too, right? I did. I, I'm so sorry. I, yeah, because I had to put up a, my wife wanted a, uh, a umbrella and it has to have a foundation, a brace, so it won't blow away. So it has these four plastic things that you fill up with water and each one of them probably <laughs> weighs 30, uh, 30 pounds, something like that, but it has handles on the side. So I picked them both up. Oh, You man. felt it, huh? Oh, I... I'm you still knew it. feeling yeah. it. Uh, you know, it's because uh, me, you, and Alice, your wife, were talking yesterday, and it didn't seem like she had too much sympathy for she's your— She's German. Yeah. She's German. <laughs> uh, come on, tough it out. <laughs> she laughed, I think, more than she felt sympathy. I, I, she's great. It's better for me that it's not that way. I don't need, oh, poor guy. No, I need—I need—come uh, on, you could, you could do this. She was— I could just me. imagine the difference between, like, if your father hurt his back in the house and it was a completely Jewish family, and I'm sure Got to every- go to the doctor. Let's go to the emergency <laughs> room. We got to take a blood sample. Let's see if every- <laughs> but I'm But then with your wife, it's like, you'll uh, be fine. You'll be fine. That's yeah. right. And if you die. Uh, you know, so what? <laughs> Which is, hey, it's, you know, we have a reservation in heaven already. He's building a mansion for us. That's right. Eh, no problem. That's right. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you're here at least. I know. Oh yeah, it's great. Great to be here. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I know your back is hurting. Um, but uh, hey, listen. Um, we, we've got a great show lined up for for a great I know. show. Con- I, I am loving this, Chris. I don't. Whose idea was this for the seven sons? I don't know. I think I know him. His name's Steve Herzig. Oh, well, yeah. Actually, I got it from another guy just in conversation. He didn't even know he gave it to me. We were just discussing the New Testament, and he he was talking about his Sunday school days uh, and how he had to memorize uh, uh, the seven signs of John, and he got a free camp experience. Oh, uh, to me, if they gave me camp as the thing, <laughs> I would have said, wait a minute, this is a p- prize I'm supposed to get, well, not a penalty. Well, that's why, well, th- don't talk about it yet, but you set us up for a, our new spot too, okay? So just everybody, that's a good reason for you to stick around. If you, <laughs> if you think our teaching is bupkis uh, in the Bible, at least stick around for the news because we're going to tie it all back in in a moment. But uh, just a quick reminder that the Jew and Gentile podcast is sponsored by FOI Equip. It's your opportunity uh, for free, for free, for free. I don't know how many times. I can say that, Steve, for free. Well, you are the one that says seven times you got to be able to say something in order for 
people to remember. That's right. So we'll just say it three more times for free, for free, for free. <laughs> FOIequip.org. It's there that you can learn the Bible from a Jewish perspective. And we are wrapping up a three-week series with our very own Lorna Simcox, the editor-in-chief of Israel, my That's glory. That's been fantastic, yep. Chris. I've just enjoyed her so much. And uh, we've had great questions. Uh, hey, we had a gal. She, I don't know if she'll be listening to this. Pinky Pinkus. Oh, I, Pinky. I see her on all the time. Pinky yeah. Pinkus from California. And uh, I, I had just noticed her uh, when I was uh, helping out Lorna uh, last week. And I'm telling you, Chris, she's from Ohio. She's a Buckeye. Uh, she's Jewish. And she believes that Jesus is the Messiah. So she's a believing Jewess. Praise the Lord. And uh, yeah, it's wonderful. She had an opportunity to share her testimony. But Pinky, I said, Pinky, your parents didn't do that to you, did they? She said, no. I think her name was Sharon. And she said, but I love my nickname, Pinky. <laughs> I, I didn't it. ask her. I, maybe I'll have to ask her, how did she get Pinky? But Pinky Pinkus, <laughs> it's a fantastic <laughs> name. It's a great name. You know, this is a, a constant conversation that I have with Laura Coleman, um, uh, our uh, administrative assistant here in, in our department at Friends of Israel, that there are times for the classes I wish it was just a webinar where we could just see the face of the speaker and the speaker had all, you know, like could just focus on that. And because um, then, you know, sometimes people when they're on, they click their butt, their their audio on and you can hear their conversations in the background. And you have to turn it off. And but it's a, it makes it real, Chris. But that's the thing, as I was saying, I love meeting people from all around the pinky and and all of these people that are coming in from. And I'm not even joking to our listeners. People are tuning in from all around the world. At Australia. We had last week we had Australia and Chris, we got a guy on a boat in Toronto. <laughs> He's on a boat. He's sitting there drinking on his boat and listening to the Jew and Gentile. I go, I want to be up there. It's fantastic. You know, it's so amazing. we've got a great audience and uh please join us. Go to foiequip.org. You can register still to be a part of uh Lorna's class. The last class is tomorrow night. Um, it, that, that means Thursday night. What, what is today's date? Steve, I don't even know what today's date is. Uh, I believe it's the 28th. Or okay. 29th. So this is the 20. So with, it's just the Thursday, uh, of, I believe the 29th is the last night or, uh, well, I'll get you the exact dates in a moment. No, maybe but, it's the 20 and tomorrow's the 30th cause it's July 1st on Friday. All right. So there we go. So what date is it then? It's the 29th. Oh, this is so you can <laughs> the 29th tomorrow's 30, the 30th and then Friday is the first okay so that means the 29th then so you so that you know june 29th is lorna's last class no 30th 30th T today is the 20th oh yeah 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 i were uh, we, Oy, we, me. <laughs> <laughs> sorry everybody we didn't plan for all this we have part. to do is turn on our phone we could find out the date that's the problem i was looking around for my phone and i didn't see it anywhere that's why i was getting all confused and whatnot but uh we just lost about half our listeners i they know say, these guys are we just crazy. went from three to one and a half that's right that's right uh no it's so tomorrow night, June 30th. There we go. So if you're listening, you're wondering, what, well, when is it? It's June 30th. It's tomorrow night. Lorna's last class. You can free, still be free, a part free, of it. Free, 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 free. That's right. And you can still be a part of the free online class where she shares her testimony and how we can engage in the Jewish community, share the love of the Messiah with them. Uh, and then uh, we have other uh, events coming up um, as well. Go to the website to find out how you can register, foiequip.org. Steve, we are in John chapter Five. We Take it away. John chapter 5, because we've already covered two of the seven signs that have taken place. The water that was turned into wine, and then we have the nobleman's son healed, and we've covered those. And now we're coming to chapter 5 of the third sign that John the Apostle is going to be writing to prove, to demonstrate that Jesus indeed is the Jewish Messiah and the Savior. And in chapter 5, it starts off and it says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Mm. And I want to stop right there. Yeah. I, I'm glad you're stopping right there because I'm already hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's a feast of the Jews. So why did Jesus go down to Jerusalem, or really up to Jerusalem? And we'll talk about that. But the feast of the Jews. Chris, there's a passage in Deuteronomy that tells Jewish males uh, that they must be of the seven feasts, three of them, they must be in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus was not just saying, hey, I think I'll take a, a stroll uh, from Capernaum in the Galilee and come, up and come down. N no. 
Because that was a hike, too. I mean, we're not talking about getting in your car and going. We're talking about a two-day journey from It, it is, but every man had to do it. Mm-hmm. They had to be there. Thus, there's a crowd. Remember, John's goal is to pick the seven. He did all kinds of miracles, but he's picking seven of them as signs to demonstrate who Jesus is. He's already turned uh, water into wine. We t- discussed that. The uh, nobleman's son, 30 miles away, is healed. And now he's in Jerusalem with all these people, and there are a lot of people there. So and these it, are. this is going to be one of the three feasts, then, that require a Jewish person to go up. 100%. Which is uh, it could be Passover. Passover. It could be uh, Shavuot, mm-hmm. which is Pentecost, or it could be Tabernacles. Right. Uh, most commentators say it's Passover. The writer doesn't tell us. Right. So he believes it's important enough to say that it's a feast. Thus, the reader's going to know, oh, that's that's when they go down there or up there. Mm-hmm. Because, in fact, I keep saying down. And Jesus went. But it is technically down, but you have to go well, up to get to Jerusalem. Well, it's going from north to south, but he's going up to Jerusalem. Right. And, Chris, when, the moment I read up to Jerusalem, I have to think of Friends of Israel. Why would I do that? Because our tour to Israel is called Up to Jerusalem. It's one of the most fantastic. Na- Every time I've been have to Israel. Have we copyrighted that? I'm just thinking. I don't that's, know if we have, but I, I got to tell you, Israelis, in my experience, when I'm in Israel, and, you know, you have your little lanyard you're wearing and uh, tells, you know, your name and what tour you're with. When you say Up to Jerusalem or the bus has up to Jerusalem, so that when you walk around, you see, oh, there's our bus up, up to Jerusalem. That's us. Israelis say, up to Jerusalem. That's all, it is. It's twenty four hundred square. It's twenty four hundred feet above sea level. Yep. Any way you come, you're going up to Jerusalem. Yep. It's a great name. It's a great name, and that's exactly what they did. That's what the the Psalms, the last bit of the Psalms, are called Aliyah Psalms. The going up psalms, when they would go worship, they would sing psalms on the way up because you're going up to Jerusalem. So we invented karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that. I didn't either until you just, you, you, t- I just thought of that. It is the ancient karaoke machine. It, 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 can you imagine? Your, hey, hey, this reminds me of a song. Let's, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> But it wasn't, uh, I, you know, it wasn't just any song. There was, uh, there was a liturgy of songs from Psalms that they sang. It's the original karaoke. Oh, that is amazing. I never thought about that. But it often was associated those with, with suffering because you're suffering as you're climbing those. Again, it goes right along with who we are. I just told you, as soon as you get hurt, something's wrong. Oh, of course. Is anything okay? Is anything okay? Wait a minute. Is anything okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry. No problem. People probably think these two guys are so <laughs> there. I mean, we're, we're having a good time studying God's word. I'm, it but is great. It's, look, look, it's the Feast of Israel. They're going up to Jerusalem, and now they're at the Sheep Gate. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Uh, it has five porches. So there's a few things here. First, the Sheep Gate is by a pool. The sheep gate is by the temple also, and that would be used for sacrifices. Mm-hmm. If you were a sheep and you went through that, it was a one-way ticket. That's right, Chris. There was no coming back. The door is uh, put behind you, and that sheep was gone. And Never f- came back. From archaeological finds, they have found the pool of Bethesda, and uh, it's just a little north of the Temple Mount area as well. And it's got. they found the pillars. They, That's right. They were able to see the pillars. So— what does Bethesda mean? Bethesda, it's, it's, I've gotten, uh, language was never easy for me. My wife, Alice's language is much easier for her. But translations, house of mercy or grace or shame or disgrace. Mm-hmm. You, you could go either way. Yeah. Oh, boy, that sounds like our people, too. Oh, grace, mercy, disgrace, yeah. shame. <laughs> it's black or white. <laughs> Pick your poison. That's right. <laughs> glass half empty, glass half full. So so Jesus is there, and there are a bunch of sick people. Mm-hmm. Th- th- this isn't funny. They're sick, and they're laying around this area. Remember, everybody has come up to Jerusalem. It's the feast. There's a sheep gate there. The author is sure to tell us that. And there are lame people, paralyzed people, blind people, and they're laying around. And the text says... 
that they were, uh, and this is a controversial, uh, somewhat controversial, verses three and four, because uh, it was added later. They haven't found any documents, any verses uh, that are earlier that go with the book of John. So Mm -hmm. uh, when you read your Bible, you might even have an asterisk. Uh, there to, that tells you uh, this might have been added. Yeah, but either way, the uh, the they were waiting for the movement of waters, and the angel went down a certain time in the pool, stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well after the disease uh, that they had. So, so you have this story. John is saying they're sick people. He, Jesus is in Jerusalem. There's a a man there who's very sick. And Jesus asked him a question. In verse 5, it says, now a certain man. There was a certain man there. Isn't it interesting? John just said there's a certain man. He doesn't name him. Yeah, no name, yeah. He doesn't name him. And he says he had an infirmity for 38 years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Chris, if I had an infirmity for 38 years where I'm laying around, I, I would not have been as nice in my conversation with Jesus as this man was. Yeah. Uh, I know, because look at you. you you've got, your back is hurting. And I'm not at, afraid to tell all our I know. I, 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 knew, I knew back on Monday. Uh, you're that's like, right. back, first I'm, thing out of my mouth. That's right. Look, you, I got a text bright early in the morning. My back's out. You're not going to see me today. That's exactly <laughs> right. You, let the whole world know. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they should only know from the Tsuris, another word we use. That's right. right. Tsuris is trouble. I got trouble. Yep. Oh, do I got trouble. But anyway, so... We got this man who is uh, sick. He can't walk. And Jesus asks him a question. I love this question, Chris. Uh, Amidst all this, Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Yeah. Do you want to be? What would you say, Chris? Well, I was just thinking as you were saying that he's there to be made well. Um, You know, Bethesda is actually, there's a hospital called Bethesda. I mean, because it has the idea. They've taken that name, a very popular hospital called Bethesda. Uh, Bethesda. There's I think Beth- it's in Washington, D.C. That's, that's where presidents have gone, generals have gone. That's right. And then there's Walter Reed Hospital, which is in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and uh, these, I mean, that name is associated now with healing. And So they're going with the grace part, not yeah, the that's, shame. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame you're here right now. <laughs> it works doubly. Yeah, exactly. That It's actually... Uh, I don't mean to get off on you, but, you know, we serve at a hospital in, in Israel. And it's funny because I sat down with the marketing director of the hospital, and he says, we have a real problem because uh, the marketing for the name of a hospital in Israel, and I forget, it's Bet Holim, I think, uh, which means house of the sick. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, it's just bad marketing because you don't want to go to the Come house to of the, the sick. the house of the sick. <laughs> that's all right. So anyway, uh, that's just getting off topic. But uh, the, the, the thing that comes to my mind is he's there to get well because he's waiting for that bubbling to come up. And actually, there were a series of dams in the pool of Bethesda. And that's where that bubbling was coming from is the water was moving from one section to another. The bubbling would happen. And, you know, uh, and all of a sudden you jump in to try to be healed. Uh, and so that was what was coming through my mind is thinking, well, I'm already here. I'm, I'm not here for any other reason to be healed. So it's a great question, I think. Yeah. And I, you that's know, bubbling water question. is hydrotherapy. I should have gone into that. <laughs> that's, it's like a, a little, sauna that's right. or a spa. A hydrotherapy. But isn't it interesting that Jesus asked him that question? And Chris, I thought of friends of Israel, and I also thought of believers in general. Jesus came to him. Mm-hmm. He, he approached him. I got to tell you, I, do we always approach people when they look like they're in need? Sometimes I think we might, mm-hmm. but sometimes we, we don't want to look at. There's homeless people around, and you, you feel bad, but you don't want to get involved. The, here was a guy laid out for 38 years. Jesus said, asked him if he wanted to be made well. He went to him, mm-hmm. and after he went to him, he talked to him. Uh, man, sometimes you don't want to. You know that when there's somebody who seems like they're in need, the last thing is to interact with them. Who Are they crazy? We use the word Meshuggah. Oh, these people, they might be Meshuggah. What yeah. are we going to do? But he talked to him, and then he offered him help. He offered him help, mm-hmm. and he was trying to meet his needs. I thought, th- I thought that was a – it's very simple what he did uh, – now, he's the son of God. John is writing about this incident because he's going to demonstrate who he is. And so what does he say, Chris? You, you're in the text. Yep. What, 
Jesus has is, is come to him and said, hey, you need help here? Uh, do you want to be made well? And he tells him, I can't get I can't get there. What does Jesus say? Uh, well, he said, sir, uh, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred while I am trying to get in. Someone else uh, goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And all at once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. And Jesus isn't even from Germany. <laughs> he just did He just did what? Hey, come on, get yeah, up and walk. That's right. No sympathy. Move. Just, he Boom. Yeah. And immediately, he's made well. I, I can't even imagine. 38 years, his bones atrophied. He, he, he was weak. He couldn't move. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus healed him, it wasn't a there wasn't therapy involved. He's ready. Yeah. He he picked up his his bed and he walked. Now, Chris, we have a problem. What's I mean, this is good news. Yep. He's he's we have a couple of problems here. First of all, did the man know who Jesus was? You know, that's a good question. It didn't seem like he had an idea of who he was at all. He didn't in the text. He it didn't like later he was... on in the text we're gonna find that he finds out who he is because Jesus comes back to him. Isn't that amazing? To, I'm, I'm glad that you – I never thought of it like that before, that he didn't technically – you know, in the earlier accounts, especially with the nobleman, you know, the nobleman goes a long distance because he knows Jesus and he's been hearing about him and he has a need. Here is a guy that – so, you know, a lot of times people – we do – if somebody – oh, I know who you are. Will you help me here? Jesus, he wasn't even looking for any acclaim. He just, there I he think is. he said, take up your bed and walk, and he left. And he just. <laughs> oh, you think he just left? I, I, I don't think he hung around. Be why do I say Zai that? Zai that Live and be well. <laughs> <laughs> he might have said yeah. that. <laughs> but I don't think he did because he didn't know who he was. Look at what the text says after that. The, uh, and immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and walked, and the day was the Sabbath. So Jesus went his way, he went mm. his way, and then it says, uh, the Jews therefore said to him, who who was cured, it is the Sabbath. What are you carrying your bed for? It, so he's walking around, and now they're pinpointing him. Jesus isn't even around. That's a good point. Yeah, he's not even around, and that's when the Pharisees, they, they see him, and they're saying, you're breaking Sabbath laws. You know, forget about the fact that he's been an invalid, he's been... Uh, you know, uh, uh, injured or whatever the case might be for 38 years. And now all of a sudden, instead of going, Joe, what? what? You're walking. Nope. It's immediately to the fact that uh, he's broken the law. We don't even know. It could be a comment. It's not, it's, it's fair to question. We don't know. It could be they walk by that guy every day mm -hmm. and, but didn't know who he was. Uh, and now all they all they see a guy walking around with his bed. It's the Sabbath, and they're Pharisees, and they're saying, "What are you doing here? You're not allowed to do that." Uh, and so the text goes on, uh, and it says, uh, "But the the uh, okay, but the verse thirteen. I'm sorry, but the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So he got, as I said, he got lost in the sauce. Mm -hmm. He just he just moved on. Afterwards, Jesus found him. So Jesus then goes after him. This is after. And he says to him, and now they're at the temple, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a thing to say. Hey, you've been made well. Zai gesund. Don't, do, don't sin any more. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. So he's now seeking out the Pharisees, saying, "Oh, you know, you were telling me. Here's the guy. That, that's the that's guy him. that made me yeah. well." Can I? Can I? Say, there's two things I, I I think we should focus in on here. The first is the religious leaders whose legalism, uh, legalism tried to rob this uh, man of a of a miracle, a and blessing, a blessing. Um, and then the other I want to look at is verse 14. What Jesus said. Uh, about, you know, uh, stop sitting or something worse may happen to you. See, you are well again and, and, and you know, go on, but sin no more. Um, I want to talk about those two things. But first, I want to talk about the idea of th this happens a lot in the New Testament where Jesus almost seems on purpose to want to heal on the Sabbath. 
I think we had talked earlier, Steve, seven times it happens throughout the Gospels. Yeah, I even wrote them down, Chris. Uh, in, in Mark chapter 1, Jesus sent a demon out of a man. In Mark chapter 1, in the same chapter, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 5, that's what we're covering now, the lame man. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus heals the man with a shriveled hand. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus restored a crippled woman. In Luke chapter 14, he heals a man with dropsy. I didn't even know what dropsy was. Uh, I remember reading that the first time I re read the King James Bible. You know what that is? That's edema. When, when uh, your lungs or your heart or any kind of organ fills up with water, mm. uh, it makes you swollen, and it could ultimately kill you. And so he healed. That was Luke 14. And then we're going to cover one of the seven signs is in John 9 when he healed the, born, uh, the man born blind. So the seven specific times that he was strategic in breaking the law. He, there's no question he broke the law. The question is what law? which law? That's right. That's the question. And I was just looking around because I'm trying to find the one because you also, he, he's, oh, uh, Matthew chapter 12 uh, in verse 8, um, there's that passage where Jesus and the disciples are walking through the field and they pick grain and the disciple or the Pharisees look at them and say, you're breaking the law because you're threshing or you're harvesting. And all they were doing was picking grain off of, you know, and eating it. They were mm -hmm. hungry. And Jesus enters into this conversation and he says, for the son of man is Lord over the Sabbath, which I really think is going to help us answer this question of, you know, Jesus, I believe, is intentionally doing ministry on Sabbath to prove a point to the religious leaders. And I, I, I think He's it comes strategic. down to which law, the, the, when we talk about what laws, what we're actually trying to say is there's biblical laws and then there's rabbinical laws. Chris, I was raised with rabbinical laws that I thought were biblical laws. Um, and there's great debate uh, amongst the, uh, in the Talmud, you'll read about it, in uh, Midrashim and all these extra uh, biblical uh, sites. There's a professor you and I both know. Uh, his name is Doug Bookman. Mm -hmm. And Doug likes to, uh, he, the way he says it, just kind of, it's, it's in a melody kind of way. When he talks about, he, he read in order for his dissertation, he was reading about uh, breaking the Sabbath laws. And one of them was when rabbis were debating about picking your nose. Mm -hmm. Is that harvesting? <laughs> yeah. And the, he, the way he said it, the way I said it probably has grossed people out, but the way Doug said it, it he kind of just rattled off all these different things. But that's what they did, the minutia. They yeah. would they debate the minutia of what does it mean when you're supposed to rest? That means you're not allowed to work. What aren't you allowed to do? Well, and then they start talking about these various things. So you're talking about reaping or harvesting these were the seven I mentioned had to do with healing, and so if you're a, 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 in Israel, the Sabbath laws, you could go to the emergency room in a hospital because that threatens the life of the person. There's no question that the rabbinic law is removed. You need an emergency surgery. You need an emer whatever it is, by all means. But if you have a procedure that could be done anytime, yeah, uh, then you can't get an appointment for that doctor. Uh, to heal you, if you will, mm -hmm. um, because he'd be working, and they don't they don't allow that. But the thing that we can say about all of these Sabbath laws, especially when we look at the Pool of Bethesda, we look at this man, thirty eight years, you know, and an invalid, and and Jesus says, "Do you want to be made well?" It's it. Jesus isn't intentionally trying to break the law. It, he's it, it all has to do with life. You know, they were hungry. So they ate. Is that breaking? The, is it wrong to break to to pick food off and eat it right there, or is that sustaining life? You know, uh, ha having a man get up from his pallet and walk—that's life. That's giving life, and that I think becomes the big question for Jesus as he's speaking to these Pharisees. And a lot of what Jesus did was speak into these rabbinical laws, uh, these le legalistic laws that we would even say were fences around the law uh, that prevented. The, the Jewish people from ever, you know, it's how do we make sure we never break the law? Well, then let's just make the laws. We build a fence around the law so that we never even touch the law to begin with. 100%. That's exactly that's exactly what's done to this very 
day. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, John is strategic here. He's picking out, remember, Jesus did lots of miracles. We'll, we, maybe in heaven, we'll learn about them. But I think it is, and I think it's going to take us a long time to learn about them. He healed lots of people. He did lots of things. But the Holy Spirit is strategic, in this case using John, to specifically give us seven to prove the point. And that's a, even a greater point, Chris, because what is probably 90% of the time, in my experience, when uh, you're trying to share the gospel with somebody, whoever it is, what's the book? Every, uh, pastors use it. Missionaries use it. People on the street use it. You listen to a, uh, a Christian show, and they'll give you one. They pick one Bible book mm -hmm. of all the Bible books. It's often at times even just separated into its own book that's so that right. you can it's, hand it's, out. No, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm going to give you the what? The Gospel of John. It's always the Gospel of John, and they're, they're strategic in doing that. Mm -hmm. So... The reason is we need to get you the good news. And there's an author. The Holy Spirit selected him. It's the Holy Spirit's words through him. And the end of that book says, this is why I'm writing this. Now, Jesus did a lot of things. This is in John 20. He's done a lot of things. But I'm writing this so that you may believe. And here is one of those critical moments, Chris, because from a Jewish point of view, mm -hmm. The Pharisees have a hard time with Jesus being what? The healer or the Messiah? Even more. God, oh, God, of course. Yes. 100%. And so this is demonstrating, wait a minute, you're healing on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. God is the one that gave the Sabbath. And Jesus is demonstrating to him, hey, I'm God over yep. the Sabbath. Here's I'm Lord. A, the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. I, I, I can't stress it enough because I'm doing this study coming up for uh, a, a family camp up at Word of Life Bible Institute or, or Word of Life Camps. And my whole thing, five messages, is on this topic of the Son of Man because the Son of Man is an individual, a human in Daniel chapter 7, who God gives all authority, power, dominion, honor, and glory to to rule over everything, every nation, tribe, tongue, language, you name it. And so here Jesus is really speaking to the Pharisees when he says, you don't have to worry about what I do on the Sabbath because I am the son of man is been given all dominion, power, and glory by God uh, to rule over everything. Don't worry, the son of man is Lord over the Sabbath. I determine what is work on the Sabbath. And I, boy, Rest. I, I hope I get a copy of your messages. I'm uh, very interesting. Is there any way any of our listeners could head oh, up to I, you know, Actually, they do. I think they do post them online. I'll have to find them and let them know. Okay. Well, here's the question I had uh, before we started. I asked you th this question. Before Jesus even was incarnated, so uh, way before, here's the question. Does God work on the Sabbath? I think uh, any Jewish person would probably say no. He rests just like he rested in creation. But you and I were talking earlier, and you made me think differently about it because of a passage. Well, only you... because of the Bible passage. I never really thought about it, but now I just I thought to myself, wait, does God work on the Sabbath? Well, listen to uh, Colossians chapter 1, for starting in uh, verse 14. For by him all things were created. We know that. You just quoted that, Chris that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities, powers, all things, Chris verified, were created through him mm -hmm. and for him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, but that's what he did. He created. But here's verse 17 of chapter 1. And he, this is speaking of Jesus as God, is before all things, and in him all things consist. And They're the sustained. King, the, the, the King James says he works all things. So the fact is, if God took Shabbat off, Chris, gravity would end. The earth would, I don't know, would plummet. The sun wouldn't be in rotation. He's holding all things. And does he, <laughs> does he take off on Sabbath? <laughs> Friday night, every, up. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> it, what if sun, God, moon, stars fall from the sky. You know. What if God took off? For Shabbat. <laughs> he just needs a vacation. <laughs> God is always working. Yep. I, I like the way the New English translation says it, Steve, because it fits perfectly with what you say. He, it, um, the New English translation, the Net Bible says, 
He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. He's ho- he's, he's, he's whole, working. He's got the whole world in his hands. He does. <laughs> yep. And I never really, th- you know, we sometimes compartmentalize God. We believe in the triune God. We believe they're equal. We believe they're the same. We, we the, the God is God, but he is in three distinct persons. Mm-hmm. And so... We say, oh yeah, Jesus. Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. So he, so there are instances where Jesus broke the rabbinic law and worked. Yeah, I'm saying God's working all, all the time. He's yep. never taken a Shabbat off. <laughs> I never thought about that. That is really good. Well, Steve, look at you. You should write a book. <laughs> God's never taken a Shabbat. <laughs> no Shabbat for God. That's and aren't you glad? Aren't we? Gl- he holds everything together yeah and 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 so here is the and that by the way i think the jewish mind the pharisees would have agreed with that yeah i there's no question when i was at, uh in hebrew school and we talked about genesis that one of the questions the teacher would ask is say wait a minute is is did god take shabbat off w- well in in the sense that he stopped creation he's demonstrating or leading by example that we need to take a day off. But God isn't limited. He did that and and told us that so that we would rest because we're limited. He's unlimited. So the, the Th- Jewish technically, I mean, I, I there's even correlation to us. You know, God stopped creating after six days and he rested, but yet he still held everything together, as uh, f- as Colossians one seventeen says. And in some ways, I mean, we still we. Uh, we just went. Uh, we we led one of a group through uh, Brooklyn the other day, a, a Christian group through Brooklyn, and we went to a kosher kitchen. and And an Orthodox Jewish young man taught us all about the kosher kitchen. And uh, but it was fascinating what you can do, what you can't do, how you can eat. But but still, they're still eating. You can still eat on Sabbath. You just can't prepare on Sabbath. But still, that idea, like it's not like God says you have to stop sustaining yourself for life you still have to hold together your your diet and your you still need to drink water yep. you still need to sleep you have to pick the glass up you have to turn you have to turn the you know pull the turn the spigot that's whatever. right you can yep. do all those things it's a su- you're sustaining life but you're but you're taking off from the things that distract you from God, essentially. Now we're doing what they do in rabbinical school. I know. What we're are talking we talking back and forth? I know. And going back. And forth. Rabbi Herzig said this, and <laughs> the crazy Gentile guy said that. That's uh, right. But but you, you go, it goes on, and Jesus would then be persecuted. Think about that, Chris. Jesus is persecuted because he healed this man. Yeah. He's persecuted, and persecuted is one thing. They wanted him dead. Yeah. They wanted to kill him. And the reason is, verse 18, and I think we should talk about this, it says, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. Mm. Chris, from a Jewish point of view, I I agree with what there's, that is the most, that's an abomination from a Jewish point of view. How could a man be God. That's the that's the thrust of the whole Bible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the 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 prophets looked forward to him, this Messiah. The Jewish people believed he was only going to be a man. Then we are introduced to him and the way he was born through a virgin, uh the place that he was born, the things that he was able to do here in John, he's authenticating just like in Matthew, authenticating who he is, but in John's case not just the Messiah, like Matthew was trying to say, but here in in John, uh, that he is the Savior mm-hmm. of the world. Yeah, Can, that's so. The idea of the Savior of the world it even boils down to my individual relationship with Him. That through the Savior of the world, I have a relationship with God, and I've been reconciled to God. And it makes me think of that last section, Steve, where he says, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Uh, The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. And, you know, I think some texts might even say, go and sin no more. Um, Maybe you've heard it that way. And you know where my mind goes to? I, I think even as Christians, we have this capacity. God, Jesus comes to us, you know, he heals us of our sin. 
And yet sometimes we can find ourselves going back to the ways of life that were before we knew Christ. We can find ourselves sinning again. I, I, I often think, you know, the Christian life, it, Jesus is saying, you've been healed. Don't go back to the old ways that you've lived. Because even if you want to look at it and say, maybe he made some unwise decisions and that led him to this place. You have the spirit, got, Jesus is saying you've been healed. Whatever you were doing before, don't do that anymore. You've been, you've been set free, walk, live a new life uh, in me and, and find that freedom. And I think of, of Romans chapter 6 where it talks about the fact, I believe it's Romans chapter 6 in the very beginning, Steve. Let me see if I can get there quick enough. Um, yeah, Romans chapter 6, where, where Paul opens up and he says, what shall we say then? And think of almost think of yourself as that, that man sitting on at the pool of Bethesda and just think you know about what happened to him, how he was lame and then he was healed, and Jesus says, go and sin no more. And here we are, we've been forgiven, given a new life, forgiven of our sins. And then look what it says here in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? I think it's a great connection. It's a great connection. And uh, in this text, it's interesting that the end of the text, and, and we're covering the signs, but I I just want to go over briefly, if I can, because in my Bible, starting in verse 31 and to verse 47, it talks about a fourfold witness. So in verse 33, it says, you have sent John, and he has borne witness to the truth. That's John the baptizer. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 36, it says, but I have greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. They were the very works that I do. They bear witness. So now he's saying, John said, the kingdom is coming, the Lamb of God. I'm doing works that are miracles, that are signs. Then it says, you search the scriptures. The scriptures. That's the, that, that, that's the, the text that's given to the Jewish people, and he's there. You search the scriptures. Uh, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify to me. And then in verse 45 it says, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is no one who accuses you. He's talking to the Jewish people. And who does he pick? Numero uno on the hit parade for us, Moses. Yeah. Moses. Moses in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Chris, today we can go to, if they're, if they're G Gentile, with a Christian background, we can mention Jesus and quote Jesus, and they'll say, eh, forget it. Yep. If we go to the Jewish people today and say, look what Moses said. Moses said a great prophet will come in Deuteronomy 18. Moses, that you believe Moses. Yeah, I do, but it, I don't believe that. That's the same problem they had in the first century with Jesus right, right there. there. I know. It's unbelievable. But, you know, that's the same problem the Israelites had. We talked about this when we did our study on the presence of God in the, in the, in the tabernacle and temple. They had the presence of God in their the cloud by day and the fire by night, and yet they still, the God that led them through the, parted the Red Sea, led them out of Egypt, that same God that brought them to Mount Sinai, Dayenu, it would have been enough, is the same God that they forgot about after 40 days of Moses being up on top of Mount Sinai. And they said, what, what should we do? We should build a golden calf, breaking rule number one they and went rule back number two. Just the way you described, they went back to their sin. That's right. He redeemed them and they went back. Good. And, yeah. and it's not just them, it's us and it's people we see every day. The text is relevant, not just in the first century, not just during Moses' That's day, right. but right today. It's the same thing. We haven't changed. And that's why John strategically picked out this as number three. Look at the amazing insights that uh, this text gives to, a, a, quite frankly, Chris, about you and me, our nature, yeah. who we are, uh, how, how we are affected by that fall of man, oh, wretched men that we are. But for the grace of 
of Jesus. And just, I mean, go when, 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 you know, when Paul talks about the great, you know, should we stamp, should we trample on this grace that's been given to us? Just think about the grace of Jesus in this moment. This guy was minding his own business. You know, he's waiting for this weird thing to happen where bubbles come up and he, you know, all this f- weird stuff. And Jesus could have passed by. I'm sure Jesus passed by a lot of people. He could have just passed by him. But in his grace, he he spoke to him. Do you want to be made well? That's uh, uh, Listen, if you want to talk about the definition of grace, there it is right there. Do you want to be made well? Uh, sure. Okay. Take your mat and walk, you know, get up and walk. That's grace. I mean, he wasn't wait. That's undeserved grace kindness from god bethesda so i guess that we go back to the place chris yeah good so do we want do we want the grace of god which is offered in jesus christ or bethesda do we want the shame and reject that grace and go back that's right uh, no i want I using want the, that same word i want the grace that's what i want and to think about that like you said it was a one-way uh, a place for the sheep that were headed for sacrifice to go to. There's Jesus, the Lamb of God, healing uh, a, a lame man. That's I'm telling you, this is this is good stuff. I, I, this can preach, Steve. It can preach. Well, hey, everybody, I hope you're enjoying our conversation on the seven signs. Uh, I'm thankful that Steve came up with this idea, which I think you said came from another idea. Uh, that, that's right. It's just that's the, right. Just God's people working out uh, for, for God's glory. So anyway, Steve, why don't we transition to the news? Well, Chris, <laughs> we're thankful to Laura Coleman once again, our assistant uh, who found this. And uh, I just think she likes the word. The word's called glamping. Glamping. But let's she l- loves using that word. She talks, you want to hear about the glamping? <laughs> well, let's go back, though, because you were talking about a guy who won an, a prize, and the prize was to go camping. To go camping so at first, a Christian camp. That's right. So first, let's talk about you and camping. Chris, <laughs> I have done limited camping. I did it in college. I went down to Florida, and we lived in a tent for a week because I couldn't afford a hotel and all that. Uh, our people wandered around for 40 years, yeah. Chris. <laughs> they were in the desert. And they had actually great conditions because their shoes never wore out. They had plenty to eat. Manna came down all the time. But enough with the camping. Yeah. Enough with the camping. I want a holiday in. That's, that's what I want. Okay, so. I, that's, I, I don't want to camp. Somebody tells me, oh, you get a first prize, a camping trip. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> you keep it. Okay, I'm, I'm intentionally not going to answer correctly, so I don't have to win the prize. That, well, uh, I got a text a couple days ago from some dads in town, and they said, hey, Chris, we're doing a camping trip with the kids in August, and – do you want to bring in your August? Ca- yeah. well, let's pick the <laughs> hottest month we can. So we're going to sweat all over the place. That's right. So I'm doing it, Steve, but I, I'm not going to lie. They're, they, I think they get it. I don't get excited about the camping, but this is glamping. Steve. Th- this is glamping, which is a in step Israel up. in it's Israel. A, and it's a great business, Chris. This is again, uh, uh, Laura Coleman found this for us, but th- they call it, th- they're, they're making a play on the words Gan Eden. And I remember in Hebrew school that that's talking about the Garden of Eden. Gan Eden. But yep. this is called Gag Eden. G A G. That's Hebrew means roof. So <laughs> roof this, of Eden. The roof of Eden. And they are businesses starting by giving uh, accommodations. Get this, Chris. Oh, this is so appealing to me. <laughs> I know. A tent. A tent. A yurt. What is a Y U R T S? A yurt. Mud huts, cabin, pods. I don't. Do you want to stay in a pod? Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> and what's a yurt? I have to look that up. Do you think when we do our up to Jerusalem tours, we could convince Jim to get us into a yurt or a mud hut I, or I, a or a pod? I don't think people would come anymore. Listen to the accommodation is intense. That can hold up to three people. Hey, my wife and I is enough. <laughs> my wife and me. That's enough. But people come with mattresses, bedding, towels, blankets, or guests can stay in a capsule built in mud that's a little larger. Um. Oh, is this appealing. The site incorporates (laughs) a kitchen shower, shared bathrooms. Yeah, that's that's (laughs) it right there. Thank God they have bathrooms, but I... I gotta share them. One of they my don't favorite. They understand Jewish people. <laughs> when we have to go, somebody else is always there. We well, that, want our own. That's what, that one of my favorite stories, Steve, of you traveling, 
I know that you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> is that you went up to this school in Canada, and it was a shared bathroom experience with all the, I, I forget. All, all the missionaries. There were older missionary men, and mm -hmm. we, the students were wonderful. We were in the student dorm, men's dorm. They left. They went and actually camped in the gymnasium, so the missionary men who were there for that weekend could have their beds, their rooms, uh, and we were in their dorm. So you glamped. They glamped while you were. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> glamping. Ay, ay, well, ay. I remember you came back and you said, I was up every morning at 3 o'clock in the morning just so I could have the bathroom all to myself. Chris, without getting specific, no, imagine about eight guys in their 50s and 60s uh, yep. years old. Yep. In my head, before when I got there in the afternoon and they're we're dropping off our suitcases. I'm thinking, what is going to happen starting at around 6 o'clock? I want no part of it. This I was up at 3. I was out of there by 4 o'clock. I had a cup of coffee in the uh, in the kitchen, and I don't know what you happened. You had there. a solid 8-hour morning. Before, I'm sure before anything even got started, you were up for eight hours, but you got that bathroom Chris, all Chris, there yourself. was one bathroom for eight guys. Yeah. At least clamping, <laughs> there's one for three. Even the, I, it doesn't even, the uh, what are those called? The youth hostels. I've stayed at youth hostels. They're not even as bad as, as this sounds. This does so. not sound great, but it's going to be a great business, Chris. Uh, reports suggest that the increased interest in glamping is a global phenomenon, with the market expected to be worth 5.94 billion dollars by 2030 is that globally or is that just globally, in Israel? Okay. that's globally the growth that... is being driven by a revived interest in staycations during the COVID era as well as increasing environmental concerns environmental concerns one bathroom for three people uh-uh uh-uh uh but bringing more people to turn ecotourism which limits the impact of their vacation. This is exactly the, the reason I chose this article when I saw it, because when Laura posted it, because I knew you would take this one personally. I take it personally. You know, I think most people would read this and go, oh, glamping, that's great. But I knew for you, this was going to become a, this was going to become a. Zygazun. No, no, not Zygazun. Well. You know, that, but maybe also. Oy, vase yeah, me. That one for sure. So for anyway. Sure. <laughs> I admit it. I Look, I'm an oy, old guy. What? Oy, oy. <laughs> Yikes. All of them. Yikes. All right, let me lead on this one, Steve, because uh, a few uh, episodes ago, maybe maybe it was even the last episode, you and I were having a conversation about gefilte fish. Love gefilte fish. That's right. And, and maybe our listeners, if you tuned in, you remember I had compared the gefilte fish to a hot dog uh, of fish. And you said, mm, more like a hamburger. And I, I, I okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you. But, again, Laura, I believe Laura, Yep. Sent us this thing. Isn't it funny how this works? This the, the, It's a Jerusalem Post article that says, Ballpark food for Bubby. Manischewitz promotes <laughs> gefilte fish dogs. Manischewitz describes the gefilte fish dog as an American tradition your Bubby will love. So first of all, for our listeners, Steve, what's a Bubby? A Bubby's a grandmother. Okay, so this is a grandmother's treat. Bu and Bubby, most uh, a Jewish children, grandmother's a treat. Jewish grandmother, most Jewish grandkids think very fondly of their Bubby. They love their Bubby. Their Bubby cooks great food for them. Their Bubby gives them treats. When you say Bubby, it, yes, it means grandmother, but it gives very warm. You know, uh, what do your kids call their grandparents? Uh, what we have, it evolves over time. My dad's name was Umpa. Uh, my mom is Gigi. Karen's parents are Pop Pop, and uh, it was Grandmama, but it got transitioned to Grum a few years ago. But it's affectionate, mm -hmm. right? That's the way Bubby is. It's 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 an affectionate, wholesome, really cozy kind. It's my Bubby. This that's is Yiddish too. That's not Hebrew. That's, Hebrew is a totally that's different right. name. That's Yiddish. Yeah, and it's a. It, there are a lot of Bubbies around. Yes. So this is officially. A, this is Bubby food. This is Bubby <laughs> food, and it's a when you go to the ballpark, you have your option to get a guff, you know maybe one day I, I don't know where or when, but your option to get a Manischewitz gefilte fish dog. That, that's right, and uh, gef, gefilte fish uh, from a Bubby who is a vegetarian is going to be very good for that grandchild because 
I, Bubby, who's a vegetarian, and we have a number of Jewish vegetarians. They're not, they're not going to give you a hot dog. Oh, you're a hot dog. You're going to die. You, we, <laughs> there's articles on every hot dog supposed to take a certain number of years off your life. <laughs> so now we have a fish hot dog. Oh, a gafilta fish. Dog. Oh, I think you would get that. Forget about Bubby. What about Zadie? I mean, I'm I sure Zadie would it. get this in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Steve, listen. A little to- relish on. Uh, oh, horseradish on the top. Oh, oh that sounds fant- amazing. Actually, fantastic. Listen to this from Manischewitz. They tweeted this, and Steve, I think you'll get a kick out of it. You asked. We listened. The R and D team has hasn't slept all week, and now the factory will be cranking out these babies twenty four six. Twenty four six, not twenty four seven. Twenty four six. That's right. I I wonder if Jesus would go in and turn that factory back on on, the, on Sabbath. Give uh, me another gafil. That's right. Uh, just in time for July fourth, an American tradition. Your bubby will love gafilta fish dog. So anyway, Steve, just following up. In our gefilte fish discussion from from uh, last week or the week before, uh, maybe one day well, our if listeners- our listeners want to do a joke sometime when they're fishing, those of us who love uh, who, who like fishing, I'm not one of them, but I love fish. So you go out fishing, and a guy or gal will say, "Hey, what are you what are you going after?" I'm going after gefilte. <laughs> what gefilte? I yeah, they're biting today. <laughs> Just on the end of the hook. <laughs> Gafilta. Oh, yeah. Gafilta is made up of multiple, as we've talked about, multiple different fish fish together. Well, Steve, I, this is what I will do because I've brought in um, kosher scrapple. Yes, And we've did. had a taste we did. of kosher scrapple here in the podcast uh, room. I'm going to go looking around for this Manischewitz. I will Gefilte too. Fish. Manischewitz, that's a well-known company all around the United States, really all around the world. But- in, in North America, Manischewitz is known, and I'm going to start looking for I'll, a gefilte hot dog. Well, we have to do a taste test on the podcast. And one thing we don't have to worry about, Chris, here in at Friends of Israel, if you leave some food out, uh, not in a vicious way, but if you leave food out, people think it's open season, and that food could be gone. Yep. In fact, there's a I am special a, place. I am, I am part of the problem for that. I'm usually the one out hunting and scavenging. There is a special place we actually, everyone knows, if you put the food there, you're allowed to take it. You could put gefilte fish there, Chris. No problem. <laughs> no one's gonna touch it. No one. I'd, I'd be the, the friends only of one. Israel too. No one's That's touching right. gefilte fish. No one's fish. touching it. All right, go ahead, Steve. What's the next one? Well, the next one is a little more serious, Chris, and has uh, repercussions that could affect the United States, really the world, mm-hmm. uh, because you and I talked about the last time uh, we talked uh, about Israel's politics. We knew that the government could fall, and indeed, it has fallen. That's it's it's not in a, a like a military coup. Yeah, no, but not like that. It's normal political activities that go on in Israel. It's they're going to create a fifth election in what three years? I, I th- think I think a lot four years. Four years. Yep. Okay, so there's going to be another election, but Bennett had to step down, and now we have an interim prime minister. Who is it, Chris? Yeah, his name's Yair Lapid. And so the reason Yair Lapid has become the interim prime minister, and he and, and when we say th- th- this is the prime minister now, so Neftali Bennett, who took over the seat from Benjamin Netanyahu, um, struck a deal when when uh, when to, to get Netanyahu who out of a uh, position of power. Um, he struck a deal with Yair Lapid. It was Who's actually liberal versus Bennett, who is nationalistic, very right of of, uh, of Lapid. But they made a deal with one another. We'll work together, even though we're from complete opposite se- you know, ends of the political spectrum. Um, we'll w- you take two years, Bennett. You bring your party into the coalition, the, the co- your conservative party, and you partner with us and you can have two years of being a prime minister. And I'll take two years of being prime minister. And they split the, the time period. But. What happened was what I think a lot of people expected, that the government that was built that ousted Netanyahu was formed by multiple, multiple— Flimsy, flimsy majority. Oh, they had Muslims, Islamists that usually sit in the opposition. They don't even want to be in the coalition government. They want to be in opposition to always oppose Israel. That's what they—they admitted that. Well, they came into the party, the coalition government. Um, uh, their party came into the coalition government. It was made up of liberals. It was made up of conservatives. And of course, you have to govern a country as a coalition. You have to unify. Well, guess what? Even Netin, uh, even Bennett's 
own party were saying, we can't do this anymore. So they left Bennett in the coalition government and moved over to the other side and, and sat in the opposition government, which eventually the coalition government became the minority and they pushed Bennett out. And now until those elections are done and they have a new prime minister, Yair Lapid will be the prime minister. And the reason I said this affects everyone is because we are going back in Israel to a liberal prime minister. Mm -hmm. uh, and that with the, Israel's had consecutive conservative uh, governments and for years, for years. And so Lapid, he's a he's an interesting personality because he's unlike past prime ministers. I thought and this was an interesting article that we found here. Very interesting. First of all, Chris, my mother would not be proud of Lapid. Not for, she'd be proud of him being prime minister, but he doesn't have a university degree. Mm -hmm. That's big, Chris. When I was in my mother's womb. The question was, where are you going to college? Uh, and every, and in fact, today, because I'm an older person, today when a Jewish child is in the womb of a mother, it's not where you're going to college, it's where you're getting your master's, yep. where you're getting your doctorate. Yep. University education is you drink water for thirst, you eat bread for food, you go to college for a job. You bet it, it are all important. And he doesn't. He's, he doesn't have a university degree. That's nope. amazing. Yeah, he actually. The article was saying he's so unique because, like you said, he doesn't have a university degree. And in fact, he go, he's going about the process backwards because he's actually more of a personality in Israeli uh, in Israel than he was popular. a politician. Yeah, very popular. He was, I believe, a news anchor. He was a he. <laughs> He was Peter Jennings. Yeah, exactly. For those of us in the United States. Yeah. He was a gr They loved him. They, and he segued into politics. That's right. Exactly. And he's worked his way up. He was actually very influential in ousting Netanyahu because he was the one who decided, you know, you have to give up power to gain power in Israeli politics. And he's the one who, who sided with Bennett and, and made this offer to him. So, you know, he might be a uh, he might not have a college degree. Uh, he might be in the communications and a popular person, but he definitely also knows politics because he, he is ousted. Sharp. Yeah, he ousted. You, ha you have to understand, ousting Netanyahu is big. He is a king maker in Israel. He is the politician extraordinaire in Israel. Longest polit prime minister consecutive years are total years than anyone. That's right. And here anyone. is a guy without a co uh, that. So the whole article was written about how different he is from most politicians. And listen what it says. Serving as foreign minister and al alternate prime minister over the past 12 months, Lapid has boosted his status both in and out of Israel. He's met with numerous world leaders, including Kamala Harris, vice president, other top Democrats. Most significantly, he headed the recent Negev summit, which included representatives from Morocco, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Egypt, and the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. Mm -hmm. He is now rubbing shoulders with the powerful, and he is accepted. So on, all those things we mentioned are unique to him as a prime minister. But once you have the moniker of prime minister, you've, you've got Doesn't the matter. goods. Yep. And he, is, he carries himself very well. He knows Israel politics. He defeated or worked a way to overcome Benjamin Netanyahu. So he's going to be an interesting person because his his desires are far more leftist than uh, Bennett's were. It will be interesting, too, because Biden, I'm sure he was preparing to go to Israel because he's going to Israel soon, I believe. Uh, he, you know, um, oh, he, Biden will go to him. No problem. Well, that's what I'm saying. He was probably preparing to go meet with the nationalistic uh, Bennett, who wants all of Israel to be Israel. You know, he thinks much differently than Yair Lapid. So now he's got to go. His his it's a totally different person you're talking to. So I'm sure he's adjusting and thinking about the things that he you know uh, Israel can do with the interim prime minister. Um, the question is, uh, what will that? You know, the the coalition government it's got to go to elections. So will Yair Lapid win? I've heard Bennett is going to run again. Netanyahu could run again because he's the leader of the opposition. There's a lot that could happen in Israel. And politics. Chris, this interim prime minister could last a long oh, time. Oh, that's actually a really great point, too, because 
elections can take a long time. And even if you win the elections, you still have to then form the government, and that could make everything fall apart. Forming the government could take a long time. He'll be there a while. Yep, exactly. So, hey, listen, that's what's going on in the news. And um, Steve. Ah, uh, the Yiddish word of the day. Well, you know, on our show notes, I took it from Yiddish word to Yiddish words of the day. So that's, that's right, Chris, because my wife, who I love, the German, <laughs> Swedish too, uh, but she, she, especially in light of when I hurt my back, uh, she found this uh, cartoon. Uh, and it has four, well, actually has three Yiddish words, one English word. I love this. And I don't know if people... Here, wait, can... let me t- let me, if you're watching online, I can... Um, there you go, Steve. So hold it up over to this camera over okay, here. Okay, there you go. Okay, that's it right there. She found this on Facebook or something that's like that, That's right. Sure. This is Jewish exercise. First. Four the, stages of Jewish exercise. Four stages. First, you stretch. That's what happened to me on Saturday. Ay, 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 I hurt myself. <laughs> I'm... Uh, Big, biggest trouble. So you go to the next phase, which I did very well. Kvetch. Complain. <laughs> oh, man. Well, does this hurt? I'm in big time trouble. I can't do anything. And then when you're kvetching, you're also schwitzing, <laughs> which happens to me when I go into your office, Chris, because 100 degrees for you is like for a person who's 75 degrees. Oh, I love oh, it the, when it's hot. I, it's like you schwitz in there. Well, so you stretch. You kvetch, then you schwitz, which means you sweat, and then what do you do? You plot. You <laughs> fall over. That, that's the way we Jewish people, that's how we exercise. I love the four stages of Jewish exercise to stretch, kvetch, schwitz. Not, it's kvetch. Get that k. Did I not say the k? You, you did, not the first time. Say it again. Stretch, kvetch, schwitz. And plots. Perfect. All right, everybody. That's it. Stretch, kvetch, schwitz, and plot. Uh, one and a two. Stretch, <laughs> kvetch, schwitz, <laughs> plots. <laughs> oh, we got it down. We got it down. You know what, though, Steve? I was even thinking about our good uh, friend that we listened, we, we read about today in John chapter five. He 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 got up. He stretched, and then he probably kvetched. And then he probably had some schwitz, and then he plots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a way to go. That's what happens. This is the reaction a Jewish person has when they go glamping. Yeah, I bet it is. <laughs> That's right. What am I doing here? I love in the- in First the- I stretch. Oh, okay, I think I might be able to do it. And then they get inside. They see it. Where's the bathroom? Then they kvetch. Then because there's no air conditioning in the place, they schwitz. <laughs> And then they just lay awesome. down and say, "Forget about it." Uh, I love in the in the cartoon in the uh, uh, drawing that Steve is holding up in the kvetch section. It says, "Oi, <laughs> oi!" That's what you do when you kvetch, right? Oh, you gotta love it. Well, everybody, that's been a great Jew and Gentile podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I cannot tell you how much uh, laughter it brings to me to be a part of the four stages of Jewish exercise, stretch, kvetch, schwitz, and plots. Be sure to go to foiequip.org. You can go there right now. If you're listening to this podcast, that means you've got your phone. That means you've got your tablet. That means you've got your computer. And all you have to do is go to foiequip.org right now, and you can sign up for Lorna's class. You could be a part of it tomorrow night, or you could be a part of our FOI Equip lecture series with Bassem Eid, or you could sign up to be a part of our Jewish cuisine class with Paula Korn. The opportunities are endless, Stephen. It's free, 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 free. 100%. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you all next week.